bar? Of course, yeah. My name is Tara Campbell. And I'm originally from Anchorage, Alaska. Oh. Um, I moved, well, I've lived a couple of different places um, on the West Coast in Oregon and uh, lived in Germany and Austria for a while, um, but Washington, D.C. is my home. I've been here the longest, and um, yeah, and I've been writing full-time for about, going on five years now. Five years. So, okay. Yeah. Um, before that, I worked in international education um, and in an admissions capacity and advising, and uh, as a lifelong student, I can't seem to uh, stay away from educational settings. Um, I'm in an MFA program now, actually, so I'm kind of doing it backwards. Um, I've been publishing, and now I'm going back to... Uh, and how's it, how does that feel, like <laughs> coming from non-training to... Right. Like, how does it feel? Like it, It's an adjustment, but you know, I, I felt like I wanted to try a new genre, because I've been doing mostly science fiction mm -hmm. and sort of uh, fabular work, and uh, I'm embarking on a new project in historical fiction, and I kind of felt like I wanted some extra support and um, some guidance for this new project because it is out of my regular writing style. Oh. Um, so the new project I'm working on is historical fiction about um, an ethnographic exhibit of Africans, specifically the Ashanti, who are from what's now Ghana, uh, and they toured the capitals of Europe as an exhibit. Uh, so they were performers slash ethnographic exhibit and they would live in these constructed villages in uh, capitals like Paris and Vienna and Munich and Berlin and um, they would be on site. It was, uh, I, I like to refer to it as a combination between the um, between the Smithsonian Folklife Festival and the National Zoo, uh, because often these exhibits took place in zoos and other large public areas, and uh, it was a, a yeah, it's something that it's hard to believe it happened, but at the time it did. It was pretty normal, and um, so that's that's my current project. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to write it from the, not the European perspective, which we usually hear, but from the African perspective. So obviously for a project of that magnitude, I felt I needed some, some guidance. And uh, so I'm in the MFA program now to help me get to that next level. Wow, that's a, well how'd you, wow, I got a lot of questions. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the sign, how, how, I don't even know where to start. Well, since, how right. do you even get to that topic? Right, that's a huge, right. I mean, out of all, that's so niche. It right. feels like, yes. how did that yes. come about? Right, it's, and it is an unexpected departure from you know what I've written before because I have you know a sci-fi book out there and now this you know historical fiction idea. Um, but the historical fiction idea uh, has been with me since the mid '90s. Um, uh, this particular uh, phenomenon, I, I was doing a master's degree in German. And I was doing my uh, thesis on the image of the Negro in German language literature. And uh, one of the works I came across was a work called Ashante by Peter Altenberg, who's a very well-known, well-respected Austrian author. Uh, and he was writing a series of flash impressionistic uh, pieces on this exhibit that he visited in 1896. And at the time, it was just such a bizarre concept to me that these people were in a zoo. And I thought, I must be misunderstanding something or something isn't coming Obviously, through. Obviously, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, in translation. Um, talked to my professors, they're like, no, you're understanding it perfectly well. That actually happened. Wow. And it unsettled me so much, of course, as a person of color, um, that I just kind of put it away. I, I, I didn't write about that particular work just because I had so much material beforehand. And I, I put that part away for decades. And it just resurfaced every once in a while where I would think, that's just 
bizarre that that happened, that that went on. Um, and so when I started writing full time, um, in addition to you know writing my normal science fiction stories, I started researching this topic. And being in Washington D.C., you know, I had a access to um, the uh, the archives and the Library of Congress, and it was just. And I, I could I should say the Austrian Library has amazing online resources, um, periodicals where you could read the advertisements and you would read the write-ups of the um, of the exhibit, and it it was it was spectacle. It was, and how did they describe the people? I'm just kind of curious. Were they? Yeah, you know, it the the exhibit was sort of treated like it it would come up in the entertainment section. So like theater or concerts, and then there, there would be the Ashanti exhibit. Um, and they were actually very well received. People were struck by you know, the, the beauty of the arts and the people. They were fascinated by them. Um, and this was a time of sort of, um, you know, people were sort of bored with Europe and they were looking for more exotic cultures to explore. So, um, you know, that's part of, how this whole practice of bringing exotic peoples to European capitals came about. Um, uh, the practice started with a German uh, zoo keeper, actually. He organized these zoos all through Europe, and he was finding that the zoo attendance was dipping, people were getting bored with animals. Uh, so people. <laughs> so people. It, it started with, uh, it started with um, a Gosh, it was from Lapland, and it was a, a group of reindeer, and the trainers came along with them, and people were so interested in these reindeer herders from Lapland that, you know, this German uh, zoo director got this idea, well, heck, let's start bringing the people with the animals, and pretty soon it was like, forget the animals, the people are the draw. So they had folks coming from... Even Eastern Europe was considered exotic in some ways, but you know, from Asia, from the Americas, and this from was South what, America. 1850, this was 1890. This started, I want to say, 1870s okay. thereabouts. Um, and in the early days, there was a lot of. Um, well, it wasn't so established, and so unfortunately, there were a lot of unscrupulous players in the market. And um, so you had, you know, people sort of being deceived and brought over and exploited horrifically. Um, and there were people under the guise of science who were taking measurements and all, you know, pictures. And um, by the time the group I'm writing about came around, uh, the practice was so ingrained that it was more like a business. And your group came around? 1896 was the 96. first tour for that particular group of Ashanti. Um, and Which you say it, is now Ghana? Yes, okay. correct, correct. Um, and yeah, by that time, it seems to have become a business transaction. There wasn't the pseudoscience of the measurements. You know, people were sort of, they had decided this was now entertainment. Um, so, uh, you know, the Ashanti brought their crafts, there was a goldsmith, there were weavers, there was dance, there were warriors, so it was like a spectacle, a show. Um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, they had given up the illusion of science, and this is all about giving the people a show and calling it an ethnographic exhibit so people would feel, you know, more high-minded about visiting. Um, so the, the thing that I found interesting in my research was it seems like the Ashanti had a certain amount of um, a certain amount of power in these negotiations. Um, this wasn't the story of manipulation and exploitation that you know one would expect. Um, after the first tour, which was uh, coordinated by French middlemen, they came back for a second tour with an even larger group of people, and. During the second tour, they broke with the French middlemen and made a contract directly with the zoo to come back for a third year. So obviously there are reasons, at least for the leaders, the African leaders in this instance. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, you know, when you write about things like this, people expect to sort of have a, a victim story and someone they're supposed to feel 
is powerless and, and, and that's the narrative that people are expecting. What I like to focus on is the agency that they did have. Um, obviously there were conflicts within the group, um, but there was some reason they were coming back. Uh, one might say they're capitalistic, you know, um, they're very uh, business minded and practical and people who, who are adjusting to their times. Um, so, you know, of course, for business reasons, they would want to continue that relationship. But, um, you know, there are some accounts of people who are, you know, interested in in other cultures, like from the African side. So the, the interest was mutual. They might be just, just as them. They're, I get to go to exactly. this other place to learn exactly. about people like they learn about me. So. Exactly. And at the same time, this is when, you know, the British colonization had finally had its full impact um, so in the, the capital. So what was the impact on their country? Did they, were they colonized? Yeah. They were. They managed to hold it off for a lot longer than a lot of other African um, uh, lands and tribes had had been able to um, because Kumasi, the capital, was in the interior in the middle of this impenetrable jungle. Um, the topography and the, you know, the, the, um, the, the climate and the land was on their side. They were also fierce warriors. Um, the Ashanti had spread their um, empire through war and domination, so they knew how to fight. Um, they were in this environment that you know white explorers didn't do well in, and they had this history of diplomacy back and forth. Um, and you can read some of the diplomatic cables between the Ashanti King, um, the Gold Coast Colony, and the British Home Office. That you know there's a real chess game going on, and uh, we often don't give uh, you know the colonized leaders credit for the amount of diplomacy that they were able to carry on. Um, at the time, but um, between those three elements, you know, the land, the warrior history, and the diplomacy, they were able to hold off major British incursion until 1896, which was the year that these tours started. So they're a combination of, um, of factors at play, um, and this probably, the tours were probably the worst of all of the bad options, given that, you know, the the war had finally come to the to the home front. So, um, so I'm just I'm in the midst of of all this research and trying to write and trying to figure out you know how I can respectfully but sort of dynamically Do you think tell about the story. Going to that part of Africa. To I talk would with love to. I would mm -hmm. love to. Um, I have not yet been to Ghana, and that is definitely in the in the future. Um, I feel like I can start writing, but I can't finish until I've been there. Yeah, definitely. So. With that story of the exhibit in Vienna, um, I was doing my research in Vienna um, when I came across the author, and then back home, reading further into the stories. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible to believe what was, you know, normal not too long ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's my new project, and obviously, um, you know, it's it's a you lot have a of title project. Or uh, can you working share? working title is the Human Zoo. Okay, I like um, it. Yeah, that's that's the working title. But I, I think of this as my ten year book. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of authors have this book that you know comes out and people think, oh, instant you know instant success, but often you know five to ten years goes into books that that come out and I think this is going to be that one for me <laughs> yeah in order to respect you know the integrity of the because it is based on history right I think it, it's right. probably trickier than exactly writing anything that's exactly you know straight yeah. fiction Right, and you know, with the with the book that I just uh, published, mm -hmm. Trevolution, you know, it's science fiction. Science doesn't have a family that you know might be feel disrespected by what you write about it. You know, so there aren't those issues that you have with historical fiction, where yes, you want to respect your material, but you also want to have compelling protagonists with you know strengths and weaknesses and who may not always make the right decisions. So that's, that's an extra wrinkle in historical fiction um, that you don't necessarily have to worry about in other kinds of fiction. Well, how did you get to the, the tree evolution? Like, I don't want to say so much, but I'll cut it out. So you, 
So the trees are, like real trees are mad. Right. right. At so the, at people. <laughs> yeah. Well, they have reason to be mad at people. But um, the the idea for tree evolution came from a report I heard on NPR about um, it was called the science or the sound of thirsty trees. And the actual science um, was from a team of scientists in France who had uh, developed an interface that could listen into the circulatory system of trees. Oh. Um, so they were able to magnify the sound and slow it down so that human ears could pick it up. And even slowed down, it sounds like these very, like popping, um, very small, crispy popping. Like if you could listen to soap bubbles popping in your bath, you know, that's, that's slowed down and magnified. That's, that's how much. Um, and what is the circulation? So day? the, the um, circulation takes place just below the, the, um, the bark. And the xylem are the channels that go up the tree and bring the water up into you know, the rest of the tree. Uh, the phloem is what comes down. So they were able to listen to the xylem sucking up water from the root system. And when there wasn't enough water, it made the same kind of sound as when you're drinking out of a glass with a straw and there isn't enough liquid oh. and you start <laughs> through the straw. That's sad. Right. <laughs> no, that's so really sad. yeah, so they could hear these trees trying wow. to drink, and they didn't have enough water. Um, and that popping was actually cavitation or bursting of the xylem, the very small channels for the water to get up the tree. Um, the air bubbles would cause bursting. Um, obviously, this is damaging to the tree. Now most trees can survive it if it doesn't go on too long. Um, but this way, scientists could hear this distress going on before there are any visible signs in the tree. Mm -hmm. So before any yellowing of leaves or any kind of degradation visibly, um, they could tell that a tree was in distress. Wow. And uh, that made me think, so the trees are already trying to tell us something and we're just learning how to understand this one thing. So what else would they be trying to tell us if we could actually understand them? That's a, that's a deep thought. <laughs> I wouldn't say deep, but that's like a, an, uh, that's a wow! I never really thought about that way because we've had trees for right the before dawn of us, time. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's I think that's what um, science fiction writers do is we think of the what ifs, and they're not always practical or even. But you're like real. many researchers, really. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm not a scientist. Working in a research lab, and you remind me of the people I used to work with. Well, you know, when you find something that intrigues you, you dig, and you're inspired by it, and um, so you read enough to be confident that you understand it, and then you start explaining it to other people, and then you realize, oh, these are holes that I don't know yet, and then you go back and do more research. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I don't think I... I couldn't study any subject this intensely if I weren't interested. I couldn't be assigned to write something and, and you know, really uh, gather the same depth of knowledge if I weren't personally interested. Um, and for me, I, you know, I have a little garden at home. It's a balcony garden because we yeah. don't have our own yard, but, you know, put my little pots out on the balcony. And so, um, yeah, I've always, I mean, my mother always had plants around. So, you know, green has always been part of my... Your environment yeah. and growing up in Alaska, of course. Yes, yeah. I, mean, I would imagine it's you. beautiful. Oh. So it it is, it is, and I think that even though I wasn't a huge like hunter or fisher person, um, it becomes part of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, it's your expectation from the world that you know nature and green and animals should you know be just as important, um, which That's is not necessarily you know an urban way of thinking, but I think that's kind of what I I brought to it. Yeah. I was going to ask you, so do you personify the trees, or do the trees still remain? Or is that too much? No, no, no. I, um, I wanted to avoid the... Uh, I wanted to try and see how closely I could get to scientific thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, try and make people guess, okay, where does the research leave off and the actual, you know, the fiction begin? So I don't personify the trees. But I sort of follow the tree network. Um, you know, trees communicate through their root systems and um, through uh, fungal networks that, that link the, the roots. And they share information. 
um, they act as a system. So I've modeled my trees after that. I kind of call it the Borg. You know, what one knows, the other one knows, because they actually do pass information and nutrients beneath the ground. So I wanted to make my trees mirror the science that I was reading about them. So you're educating people at the same time. So, you know, I, I, I hope I am. Uh -huh. I hope I am. I just found it so interesting. You know, like science fiction writers geek out over yeah. the details. Um, I, and we always have to make sure we're not infusing too much of that and, you know, putting our readers to sleep. So um, what I did, because I wanted to share more than fits in a readable story, I included uh, references, reference materials uh, oh. at the back of my book, so about um, trees and plants and about Native American culture, um, because one of my main characters is Native American. You, what tribe is he from? I made up a tribe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was... Uh, well, because it's not fiction. Right. But, I mean, it's fiction, it's I mean. fiction right? Fiction. And but that's a huge debate. And you know, as a person of color, I really thought about um, you know whether I should presume to portray a tribe I'm not part of, but have mm -hmm. researched, or if I should you know create a new tribe and and um, credit mm -hmm. that tribe that I researched, but you know not claim to represent the mm -hmm. tribe. So that was a, it's, there's a whole conversation about cultural, cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up in Alaska, for me, an indigenous voice was essential mm -hmm. in a story about natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I would have been taking them out of a story that they belong in. Mm -hmm. So I decided it's better not, not to erase that voice, but um, to, to deal with it in this, in this way that I research and try to respect a tradition but not claim to speak for it. Mm. And um, so did you ever like um, go to any of the reservations and read uh, your story? Or how did well, they, you how know, did actually, I haven't read there. I did, um, of course, go to um, the closest reservation. I, I imagine this um, story taking place in a certain area where there is going to be overlap between different ideas of how we relate to the trees so a state government's um, relationship with the trees is obviously going to be different than a Native American tribe's relationship to the trees, and I wanted to explore that. Um, so I, I did go to um, the Yakima Reservation um, you know, while writing the story, but I haven't read it there yet. I think I'm still a little, you know, understandably nervous. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Rightfully so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, you, uh, you never know how, right. how people are going to... Feel. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, you know, I did try to reach out to Yakima writers while I was writing, but of course, you know, they don't know me. They have no obligation to me. Um, I wasn't able to connect with Yakima writers. Um, I fortunately, uh, you know, am, am friends with a Native American um, writer or a, a Canadian uh, indigenous writer who was able to sort of give me some guidance in terms of general, you know, general traditions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was also And on the flip side, <laughs> have you read your work to, you know, biologists or, I forget, what do they call plant, people who study plants, I forgot the name. Yeah, but, well, bio, plant they biologists, them, yeah. Okay, I thought yeah. there was like a specific name. But okay, have you read it but, to biologists? Uh, botanists and, yeah. Yeah, bot okay, yeah. Yeah, I've, I uh, you know, I've read to people who um, study ecology mm -hmm. um, generally. I um, actually, one of the people I ask for advice on scientific studies is uh, works in um, genetic mm -hmm. uh, modification. So um, I've, I've gotten, you know, uh, some positive feedback from folks who say, you know, it was really interesting that the way I, I used as much science as I did. And how so, long did it take you to write this uh, by chance? Oh, gosh. Well, um, the first draft took a year, mm. um, and then I took another year to edit, um, and then I thought it was done, and it was not done. So um, I took a second year to, to do another round of editing, and um, then it got picked up by this uh, small press in California. Wow, so, congratulations. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Wow. That's, a whole, that's, that's a whole other you know, narrative, the whole publishing process and the decision between agents and small presses. And, um, and what's your philosophy on 
Well, I, I tried both, mm -hmm. um, and I think it depends on the type of work you've written. If you feel like your work kind of easily slots into the categories out there in the publishing world, like this is clearly uh, romance, or this is clearly women's fiction, or even this is clearly science fiction. Um, mine is kind of science fiction for people who don't think they read science fiction. Um, I, I don't write to a hard sci-fi crowd. Um, I, I, I'm trying to sort of bridge these two audiences. So, um, you know, my, if your book doesn't neatly fit into a category, um, I think we are in this age where we have the advantage of these small presses who are willing to take risks, who are willing to look, you know, in between categories. And um, my publisher, uh, Lily Cat Publishers, um, they had a connection to the region I was writing about. Um, mm -hmm. The publisher I worked with um, used to live in Washington State, where the where the. And did you know that coming in, or did I you, had no idea. Some people they kind of stop. Yeah, no, know? I um, I found the publishers uh, through a call for short stories because they they do both, and I noticed oh well they publish books as well so let me you know let me try that too and um, but you never know who you're going to connect with in what way so I, you know for any writers out there who are you know succumbing to despair um, you know it's a matter of finding the right home for your work not giving up on your work now, how do you know when something is totally maybe this is bad I shouldn't say <laughs> But how do you know something's just trash, just never should see the light of day? How do you know? When, when, when do you know it's not good? But have you ever known? Uh, you ever written something that you wish you didn't write? <laughs> I think every author looks at stuff even, you know, like two or three years ago and says, oh, I would have done that differently, you know? Um, because ideally we're always growing and we're maturing as writers, and so I don't think... I don't know if we should ever be in a position where you look back at something five years ago and are completely, utterly happy with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but, I, you know, I think there are so many publishers out there now. Maybe, you know, I've, I have had a story rejected 16 times and 17th time was a charm. Wow. And then when people read it, they're like, this is a fantastic story. Um, yeah, some stories I have sort of shelved. Um, but that's when I felt like I'm just, it's just not saying what I wanted to say yet. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I, I think writers kind of have a feeling. Once you've been out there publishing and submitting, you get you get a feeling. Like if this person doesn't connect with it, then okay, maybe it's just you know, you, you kind of learn what different publications can connect with. Some can go bizarro and weird with you and others are looking for more you know standard storytelling and if you're going bizarro and weird and it's still not connecting with this person you know accepts bizarro and weird then maybe you need to step back and look at it again but um, I think a lot of authors kind of give up too soon or they go the alternate route and sort of like you know pepper their submissions across uh, lots of publications that they're not familiar with um, so yeah, it's something you can't really know until you've been submitting and, and, and learning. So I guess um, I always ask everyone this on the podcast, and this is totally off base. <laughs> what does love mean to you? And I, just, I like to wow. know from an artistic <laughs> person. Love, you know, uh, I think it means being comfortable, but being inspired at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, not feeling like you have to hide anything, um, and yet feeling that this person could surprise you, um, and could, you know, make you think about things in a different way. And I'm very fortunate to have that with my husband. And uh, it's something I don't think I would have answered that question this way unless I had found him and mm -hmm. realized what it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's this feeling of total comfort. Um, not complacency. Those are no. two different things. Complacency and comfort. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Um, that you can tell that person whatever you're thinking, you know you're not going to be judged. Um, but that same person can also push you to think about things a different way mm -hmm. as well. Wow. So yours is not an ideological version. It's <laughs> a, you have it. So that's, that's pretty cool. 
So what would you say is your, you know, so so how long have you been writing, let me say? Um, let's see, full time for four years before that, let's see, about eight years. Actually, my husband and I started out um, writing at the Writer Center, which is a, a local uh, writing center in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, so for him, it was a new pursuit. For me, it was resuscitating something I'd let go of for decades. Um, so yeah, about eight years ago, we took our first writing course together. And Well, that's a fast turnaround for you to go from eight years ago, technically a novice, and then right, right. accomplish all that you're accomplishing. You know, I think a lot of writers, there are a lot of sort of subterranean writers out there. So it's churning, people are reading, they may have written before and they thought, oh, I have to do something practical now and I can't really, you know, have this as part of my life. So I kind of look at it as all of that reading and writing I did when I was, you know, 12 to, you know, graduating college. Um, I consider that as part of, you know, what, what it takes to be a writer. Um, writers are developing all around us. <laughs> um, people are bringing their life experiences into it. And um, so, yeah, even though I have, you know, consciously been focusing on it for about eight years, um, you know, I think any writer would say that, you know, the lifetime of experience is what goes into it. That's, that's, and so... For some people who don't know what it's like being a full-time writer, what's it like for you? Like, what's your typical day? Because some people think it's, I don't know. I don't know. I, I know when I think of full-time writer, I think of someone looking out the window and just yeah. gazing with a pen in their hand. Right. Just, well, you know, since I started the MFA program, it's a bit of a different story. But um, I, I like to start the day being selfish and working on my own stuff. Um, I have not always been good about that, but I'm sort of turning back to that now. And, um, you know, even if it's just an hour, um, as long as you cordon off that hour for yourself and you say, I deserve this hour, um, then, you know, that's, that's making progress. But I try to, you know, do my writing in the morning and then in the afternoon is when you do reading for school, you do your writing for school, you do correspondence, you know, organizing interviews like this, for example. Um, and then in the evenings, I have classes um, or readings like tonight. Um, so I, the thing I like about it is it never gets monotonous. Um, you're always moving and shifting around chunks of time. And it can get, you know, unfortunately too easy to shift your writing chunks to, yeah. to the side. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the one thing I want to make sure that I prioritize uh, going forward is to keep the writing time going. Do you have like a place that you go to or is it at home? It, it's at home. It used to be the, the dining room table. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, you know quit the, the day job and, and got serious, then we used the second bedroom. We, you know, put up my desk, got my work computer, and um, so I have my home office that I write in. But, you know, sometimes you have to change it up. You know, yeah. you start to sort of get into a train of thought and just, you know, start to stagnate in the same place. And do you listen to anything when you write? You know, I need absolute silence. Oh. I'm yeah. I I think. Or what I'm, about like a ticking clock or just no, complete no, silence? Complete silence. Uh, no, there's you know there's noise from the neighborhood. No, I'm saying like not that like these like I know some people they need like some running water or something. Mm, no, so no, the less the, the better. Yeah. <laughs> I just I look at people who can study or like my husband can read and watch TV at the same time and I just or have the radio on and I just I get too distracted especially if there's a human voice involved. Yeah. I'm just lost, you know. Yes, and I, so. you can find yourself writing what they're saying. Right, exactly, <laughs> or just weird. thinking about what they're talking about and yeah. not writing at all, you know. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I um that and that's a habit I've had since I was young. I had my little desk in my room, and I would shut the door, and I wouldn't have any music or sound or anything. And um, yeah, I'm still that way today. <laughs> so before I close, I got a few more questions, I guess. So what about your family? Now this is all based too, like. Tell me more about your life, your culture. Like, is there? Oh gosh! Like, like how was it like growing up? You know? Yeah. Um, well, you know, when you grow up in an exotic place, you don't really realize it's exotic. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was. Um, 
I, you know, I'm, I'm blessed with a wonderful family. Um, and sometimes I think, God, I, you know, I'd have more to write about if I had more family strife. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So you have but, a happy family. <laughs> yeah, you know, I do. Um, so, uh, let's see. We're kind of all scattered now. Um, and I kind of do miss the old days, of, you know, living in, in mom and dad's house. We're all in one place. But um, everybody has moved out of Alaska, really. Um, so my mom and my sister are in Seattle, and I have a brother in Los Angeles and a brother in Texas. Um, and a brother on the Oregon coast, um, so we're all kind of all kind of scattered. And they are are they? What are they? Are they like you and authors, writers? Actually, you know, my oldest brother is a journalist, mm -hmm. and um, I just I admire people who can churn out, you know, stories like researched stories that Complete have to withstand scrutiny. Right, yes. every day. Yes. I just on the regular. It's, right, it's daunting. exactly. I, asked I him have a problem time. tweeting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, and this is just my own thoughts. Right, yeah. but um, I asked him once. I said, "How do you do that every day?" And he said, "You know, you just, you just, you know, you learn how to do it. You know, you have your so, expectations and your formats, and and you just learn how to do it." I just, I've always had a huge amount of respect for that. Do you see yourself ever becoming a journalist? No. <laughs> No, you know, today it's just, I think there's so much acrimony out there now. And the comment section, like if I ever publish anything in that, with the comment section, mm -hmm. I don't even look at the comments. Yeah. I can't, you know, it's just... It's scary. Yeah, I think people feel anonymous and emboldened and journalism has just become more polarized today. And I just... Um, you know, obviously I think about it because I'm in this MFA program with various directions that we can explore. And, you know, yes, part of the program is going to be working in nonfiction, and, and it's, it's good. It's good to exercise all of those various forms. But the climate is just yeah, it's, it's, pretty toxic. <laughs> it's different. It's, it's, yeah. So it's, I, I kind of like being able to, like, make stuff up, and you can't really do that in journal. Well, you, People do yeah, it now. Now, yeah. now they do. They, People do it now, yeah, that's but that's very true. not the way I want to do journalism. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and too, I guess you seem like a very, like, I don't know how your brain works, but you seem, uh, what did you study in college? Uh, yeah, two incredibly um, uh, practical areas. Mm -hmm. I uh, majored in English and minored in German. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and then I went on for a master's degree in German. So I, um, I, I think being the youngest, um, you kind of, <laughs> I guess you can be a little bit divorced from reality in a way because you've got all these people who take care of you. Yeah. So you somehow think you can do an English degree and come out okay, which I did, you know. I mean, it actually worked out. Um, I was able to, you know, uh, go into a career in education and um, education is a wonderful area for people who, um, you know, they, they, they want to have multiple interests and be able to cultivate multiple interests because that's what it, it's all about, you know, at, at universities is like lifelong learning and interdisciplinarity. And so I think, um, you know, to anyone who's, you know, studying English and not quite sure what to do, I mean, education is a fabulous place to, to end up because you can keep learning and exploring and you're not going to be siloed and people understand if you have outside interests you know it's a very humanistic environment so I um, just happened to land in the perfect place but it was not um, by design <laughs> wow I don't know if you have any um, keep you know, last things you want to say uh, it's a lot I could feel like I could ask, have another interview with you too because you have so much I didn't expect Every, I don't know, I'm like with the, the two books in itself, and we didn't even get to get to your short fiction. And that, right, the, the thing that you read today, uh, which is one yeah. of my personal favorites of yours. Right, right. I get confused if it's like a little girl, a relationship, and real genie. Uh -huh. I don't know what I'm reading, but I know it's beautiful and emotional. Well, thank you. So, but we haven't got a chance to get on that, but maybe next time. Maybe next time. No, I, I, the thing I love about this whole experience is that we just found each other online. Yes, that was um, super random. Yeah, and um, I think that's, you know, there are, are so many online publications and so many more outlets and, um, you know, the, 
there are still, you know, gatekeepers, but you know, the, think, there's a flavor for everyone out there. You you know, um, you I don't know if you know, uh, Monica, uh, is it Beehive? She's a the, oh the yeah, off there, yeah, yeah. right. But she was she published something that's it's going to what you said. She published something because uh, she was accomplished and you know was on NPR and the Washington Post. And right. All her right. writings have made it, and I don't know if you read this post she had. But when it came to produce her first fiction, uh-huh. uh, she got turned down. And mm-hmm. she thought that she had the platform which she established through the Washington Post. She had the traditional platform built right. with her traditional publishing. And right. when it came to pr- produce her, her fiction work, she got shot down by everyone. So, yeah. she, so she, she decided, I'm going to do things off the cuff and uh-huh. totally backwards. And eventually, I, I saw her at the National Press. She sold off the National Press on her book signing a few other places yeah. but she went a non-traditional route right but right even though she was a traditional person right and um you know that's the whole it used to be that you know uh small publishers or self-publishing were these like areas that you know people just like turn their nose up at and um you know that's it's not that way anymore um and you're at what barrel house right so that's right like, is that considered what would you, what would you consider that it's, it's a small publisher. They started out as, you know, a small magazine focused on print. Um, they have, you know, of course, the web presence. Um, then, you know, as they grew, they started a conference. Um, they currently have uh, just this year launched a, an award for um, nonprofits, literary nonprofits um, in the area that are kind of like um, starting kind of startup, you know, young nonprofits that are focused on literary um, endeavors. And so, you know, they have a grant for people who are, who are you know, growing, um, growing books and literature. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, a group of guys sitting around in D.C. can decide to get together and through passion and exposure on the internet, you know, they can make this whole what they call Barrel House Empire wow. now. And it's it's And you're it's, part of it. Yeah, okay. it's you know, I've been really um, just inspired by how open and friendly they are and trusting. Um, and so I'm gonna be um, uh, the well my book Tree Evolution is gonna be the featured novel at the wow. conference this month or in Congratulations. April. Congratulations. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Um, and yeah, you know, it's just people who work together and trust each other and pitch in and you know, um, it's it's something that you couldn't really replicate at a large publishing house. And I think that's the drawing power to a lot of these small presses is it's a community. And um, you know, I think we're we're thirsty for that for community. Even here at Automatic, you know, exactly. I would. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I didn't realize there was such a little, you know, like a. Oh yeah, a you know, I got involved as a visual artist, mm-hmm. and um, I didn't know you did visual art too. Wow. Yeah, I used to paint. I was abstract, and I have to, you know, I I think. Uh, my perfectionism got in the way because I'm like, okay, unless I can draw a face perfectly, I'm not gonna paint at all, kind of thing. But um, but I was, you know, I was in the the visual arts community for quite a while and got involved with Artomatic and you know decided, okay, I'm gonna volunteer on the publicity committee one year. So I did that, and then the next year I wound up heading up the publicity committee. That's just how it works, you know. It's it's um, you know whoever has the passion and the interest and comes to the meetings and follows through on what they say they're going to do, you know. Okay, that's the person. Um, and you know, I, it's like that DIY energy. And yeah. the nice thing about it is it renews itself. You know, it it's a lot of work. And people can get burned out and, you know, they have to get back to their, you know, regular jobs or what have you. But there's always someone who's inspired enough to come pick up the torch and carry it the next year. And um, so that's why, you know, these things, you don't necessarily need a huge corporate structure to keep stuff like this running. Wow. It's beautiful. This this whole experience has been beautiful. Can't wait to see. I think it's what? Matt, we're seeing you. Was it May? Uh, some th- I have Eight. to look at my I'm calendar. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> it's like your calendar is full, but it's just as... Uh, right, right, I, yeah. But, but I know May. you're coming in May. Early May. So people who are in Alexandria or in Arlington, in the area, you will be coming to the Charles Houston Community Writers, and I will be posting that, too. So. All right. Yeah, this is awesome. Excellent. So, well, thank you. Yeah. This is fun. It's been a pleasure. All right.